Hi everyone, thanks for joining us. Just going to start admitting everyone here. Just so you're all aware, a lot of you will be muted from the get go. So just so you're aware of that, if you do want to speak or ask a question, I welcome you to unmute yourself and ask that question. I'm just going to take a moment to admit everyone and then we can get underway. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, cool. <laughs> Perfect. Well, it's great to see so many folks here. This is really, really exciting. We're very happy to have you here this evening. Perfect. Well, I will continue to admit folks as they join, um, but I would just love to take a moment to thank you all for being here today. I will introduce myself soon here and start sharing my screen with you folks so that you can see um, what we have planned for the site. I uh, just wanted to note that we are recording this session. So if anyone's uncomfortable with being recorded, I welcome you to turn off your camera if that's not something you feel comfortable with. Um, we're recording it so that we'll be able to share it afterwards so that folks that aren't able to be here tonight are still able to learn about our plans. Perfect, just admitting a couple more people. All right, I'm gonna start my screen share here. Can everyone see my slides here? Perfect, perfect, that's great. So I'm just gonna do a quick, um, a quick little uh, intro for those folks that maybe aren't super comfortable with Zoom. I think probably lots of us have used a little bit of Zoom um, since we've all been in this uh, pandemic together. Um, so if you do have any questions, feel free to raise your hand and the way you can do that is if you just go down to the bottom, there's a bar at the bottom of your screen and there should be a little reactions button. You can click that reactions button and one of the options will be raise your hand. So if you want to do that, that's a great way to get our attention as we're going through and doing the presentation just to let us know that you have a question. Um, I also would welcome folks to use the chat function. Personally, I'm a big fan. So if you do wanna use the chat fu function, you can just go to the bottom Yep. Oh, look at that. People are using the chat to show us. Um, yes, thank you to the person who just pointed out to me that I'm still in 2020 on my first slide. Who knows? The last year really zoomed by on us, uh, pun intended. Um, <laughs> so if you do want to use the chat function, I'm a big fan of it. I'll try to field your questions as they come in. Um, in the chat, but um, at the end, we will have a question session and we will be able to um, engage with the chat more actively at the end. So I would like to welcome everyone here today and acknowledge that Project Watershed has um, the privilege to be working, living, playing within the traditional territory of the Comox First Nation. And of course, this project, Kuskusam, we are undertaking in partnership with both Comox First Nation and the city of Courtney. 
and working towards a better future working together. So we've been really honored to be able to pull off this project and get to where we are today. So I just wanna thank you all for being here and for being with us. And I'd also like to take a moment to put uh, <laughs> my colleague, Jennifer Sethers on the spot. She's also here with us today. Hi there, I'm Jennifer Sethers. I'm the senior staff biologist with Project Watershed. And uh, yeah, I have the privilege of uh, bringing this project to fruition in terms of the restoration. So, and I'm very excited to say that that's gonna be uh, kicking off next week and Caitlin will be going into more details on that. Perfect, thanks Jennifer. And Jennifer will be here um, in case my technical prowess fails me at any point, she'll be fielding um, technical questions for in filling in for me where, um, where I am having any gaps. So with that, I'd like to start us off um, I'll be taking you through this brief PowerPoint. I'm hoping we can get through it in about 25 minutes or so, so that we can leave lots of times for questions. Uh, but I also tend to chat quite a bit if you haven't noticed already. So we'll see. <laughs> 25 minutes is the goal. Um, I'd like to take a minute to introduce myself. My name is uh, Caitlin Percholsky, and I'm the relatively new executive director of Project Watershed. I've been working with Project Watershed since late January this year. Um, and it's truly been a pleasure to get to learn about Project, Project Watershed's work, everything that they've undertaken so far, the history of organi the organization, and of course, all the lovely folks and the community that we get to work in. So thank you all for being here today. And let's kick it off by learning about a little bit of Kuskisun. So like I said, if you have any questions, feel free to stop me. I will slow down and go from there. So this is kind of a fun slide. I just want to introduce you folks to a little bit of the site history and the context of the site locally. Um, this is aimed at capturing a little bit of the uh, pre-colonial settler context of the site. This is an uh, Comox village site. Uh, it's actually east of the Couscousum site. So this isn't Couscousum per se, and I'm sure many of you can see that by just the lay of the land. Um, this is actually a little bit east, but it does kind of paint a beautiful picture of what the landscape might have looked like um, pre-extensive uh, settler colonial context. So it's beautiful. There's some housing here. You can see a lot of the Sitka spruce stand in the background and that will be something that we'll also look to perpetuate again at Kuskusam and we'll talk about that a bit later. Um, this is another cool little photo. This is a um, surveyor's map that we found from the 1890s um, and you can actually see the old village site is highlighted here. This is actually across the river from the current Kuskusam site. So the current Kuskusam site actually lays in this swath here between kind of 11 and 10. And you can kind of tell by the way that the river opens up and we are just kind of in that area right where the Comox estuary really um, opens up into that classic delta shape. So um, if I didn't say before, this photo is uh, from the 1850s to 1880s. That would have been a little bit what the landscape would have looked like then. This is our first good aerial photo that we have of the site. Um, and this is pre-development. Um, so that's really nice for us to see. This really gave us some good context to work from when we're working towards the restoration. You can see Kuskisum is highlighted here in this red polygon. So you can see this is kind of this where the 17th Street Bridge would have been, or sorry, will is now. <laughs> um, and then you can see it, the site kind of being naturally cohesive with Hollyhock Flats down here. Um, you can see a lot of the tree stands that you currently see propagated in Hollyhock here moved throughout the site. So um, obviously from this angle, we can't tell exactly what those species are, but we have reason to believe that they are similar and mirror what's in Hollyhock Flats currently. And then you can also see that upland vegetation up here again, large trees. Um, at the kind of 17th Street Bridge side of the site. Another thing that you can see if uh, you know to look for it, and we've highlighted it here in blue, is that there was actually a channel that used to historically move through the site to connect the Courtney River up here to the estuary down here. So this is pretty classic in a lot of estuaries. There's a lot of braided channels and a lot of tidal channels that move throughout and migrate throughout um, in the lifetime of the estuary. So these are pretty, um, pretty emblematic of an undisturbed estuary. So it's pretty cool to see that um, channel here. 
So in the 1950s, it was developed as a sawmill. Um, you can kind of see a little bit of that initial development here, which is kind of great. Um, this is another aerial photo. You can see where the 17th Street Bridge would be. Um, you can start to see those initial buildings, but it's not fully cleared and built up as it had been in the past. Um, you can see down into Hollyhock here and some of the vegetation on the lower end of the site. So the sawmill went through various iterations and obviously was kind of developed consecutively over time throughout the 60 or so years of its life cycle. Um, this is another great photo where you can actually see the sawmill while it's still river height, um, which is not what we currently see at the site. So you can actually see it here, um, river adjacent, and this is taken from across the river. So as we worked through the years, um, the sawmill was built up and built up and built up. Um, this one, this photo on the right here is from the 1970s. And if you grew up in BC, maybe these, these uh, pieces of infrastructure are kind of iconic from your childhood, but it's pretty classic. Um, a lot of um, communities had infrastructure that looked very similar to this. And you can actually start to see in that photo that steel piling wall just along the bottom here. And of course, some lovely blackberry in the foreground. Um, and then if you look over to this photo down here, this is early 2000s. And this is when you can really start to kind of visualize the infrastructure that was on the site kind of right at the end of the sawmill's life cycle. You have this big building at the back. You have some processing facilities here. You have that office building here, some log storage, of course. And then you did have um, log booming that happened in the water lots. Um, that were just in the front of the property as well. So you can also see that here. And uh, when the sawmill shut down in the 2000s, uh, most of these buildings were removed, except for this one office here. And of course, the site was remediated in 2006. That work was done by Himera, and uh, it was remediated to provincial standards for wildlands and residential soil use. So the site has been remediated, um, which is good. Um, and we do have a certificate of compliance for that work as well from the province. Awesome. So, um, oops, post shutdown of the sawmill, Project Watershed, wonder, all the wonderful directors and folks that have been working hard with Project Watershed throughout the years recognized an opportunity to obtain this land for restoration before it maybe went to future development. So shout out to all of those folks who have cons historically contributed to this work, which is great. Um, our land acquisition process really started strong back in about 2016, and we started into negotiations with Interfor to purchase the property in partnership with Comox First Nation and the city of Courtney. So we started fundraising in 2017 and raised the full purchase price, which was about $2.2 million in December of 2020. And I just want to click out of the presentation for a moment to scroll through our Friends of Couscous Sum page and just show you some of the many folks, organizations, levels of government that contributed to the land acquisition phase and who continue to contribute to the restoration. It's actually pretty incredible if you're looking at all of these names, maybe you see your own, maybe you see someone you know, the amount of community support we got for this was really astounding. So just a big shout out to everyone and um, every organization, every level of government that contributed to make this happen. It really truly was quite remarkable. If you're curious and you wanna know more about who has contributed, you can go to the Friends of Couscousum page, which is just what that is. And that's available on our website. Skipping back to the meeting. Just gonna screen, full screen this boop, from current slide. So uh, we purchased the property in for $3.2 million in kind of in December, 2020. Um, we kind of put a hold on it and then the land fully transferred by the end of February, 2021. And that was kind of the big go ahead where now we can move forward with the restoration. So we now have acquired the land in trust for our two beneficiaries, the Comox First Nation and the city of Courtney, and we can start to proceed with restoration, which is super exciting. I'm just gonna take a pause to check out the chat and see if anyone has any comments, questions, concerns. I haven't noticed any little flaggies yet, so. Stop me, feel free to unmute yourself. So I kind of referred to this 
in the past slide uh, when I was talking about funders, but I'm pretty astounded by just the level of engagement that we've had for this project and how many folks have contributed to it. So I would love to take an opportunity and if folks want to reflect on what Kuskusam means to them, I'm not speaking to the literal name Kuskusam, but more so what this project means to them, uh, what this restoration process means to them. For me, it really speaks to community engagement and community involvement, specifically to you know care and steward the estuary and our watersheds. Um, of course, there's a piece in there around the importance of working towards reconciliation with First Nations, Indigenous people, Métis and Inuit folks throughout what was now known as Canada. You know, there's a lot of different pieces of what Kuskusam means to folks. And if people are interested, they can type in the chat what Kuskusam means to them or maybe something, a theme that has come out as they've been uh, following uh, along. I just got a question here from Pam from Pam and it says, will there be a conservation covenant on the property? That's absolutely something that we're looking at. Um, the format of that will really depend, but basically we won't be um, fully finishing the restoration until there is a conservation covenant in place. So because the Comox First Nation will largely be the owners of this land at the end of the day, the form of conservation covenant is not typically something that like it won't necessarily be the traditional format that we use for other lands, but there will definitely be some form of conservation covenant on the property before it fully transfers over. Uh, does anybody want to engage with my question? Anyone? Um, yes, 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 I do. Perfect, sorry, who is that speaking? Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, this is Jeff with Natural Advantage Environmental. I was wondering if the Nature Trust is involved with the securing the covenant and that sort of thing. Yeah, that was originally one of the mechanisms we were looking at is uh, put using the Nature Trust. Uh, but because this will um, because this will eventually, like I said, be Comox land, uh, the mechanisms by which they kind of do a conservation covenant or what we would consider a conservation covenant might look a little bit different than um, the typical me mechanism for uh, nature trust. Great, I understand. Uh, is this considered regional district land or city of Courtney? Um, currently, it is owned by owned jointly by Comox First Nation and city of Courtney. Cool, thank you. No problem. Oh, and some folks are answering my question. This is great. Leroy McFarland says success for stewardship of habitat and environmental effort. Thanks for contributing, Leroy. Virginia is saying it represents resilience to, resiliency to her. Perfect. Thank you, folks. Oop. That's awesome. Okay, well, feel free to type things in as they come to you. Um, I'm loving all the responses. So now that we've talked generally about my more uh, philosophical goals, goals of Kuskusam and your folks' more philosophical goals of Kuskusam, I will skip strictly to the restoration and ecological goals, um, of which there are a handful of kind of key ecological goals for this site. The first one is to naturalize the shoreline and reconnect the site to Courtney River. Although it's listed first here, that will actually be the last step. Um, a big piece towards getting to that place where we can renaturalize the shoreline and reconnect to the river is regrading and recontouring the site to support tidal marsh and riparian tidal forest vegetation. So we will have to really uh, remove a lot of the soil on the site, get it out of there, re-amend the soil so that we can plant um, all the vegetation that the site will support in the future. Another big piece will be to create functional off-channel habitat for the salmon, as well as other wildlife. So there will be a bit of a tidal or a bit of a tidal channel that goes throughout the site, as well as a salt marsh island. Um, so I will show you folks that in a little bit. And then the other thing, this is kind of a, a goal on hold, but there is the possibility to look towards that um, traditional channel that was moving through the Hollyhock systems and connected to the Kuskusum site and reconnect the Courtney River that way. Um, that one's kind of on hold for the time being because of some um, infrastructure that is laying at an elevation that may impede that plan. So we're just kind of holding off on that one, but that may be something that we look towards for the future. 
oh wow, this looks like it's potato quality. But I will show you a slight thing of a slight. Ooh, I'm gonna turn off the sound. But essentially, this is a bit of a morphing video. Hopefully, it's showing up. But essentially, it's showing the sh slow restoration of the site over time. Um, this is kind of how it currently looks with those pockets of vegetation growing through some of the remediated soils on the site. So um, this is a bit of an older video. There has been many reiterations of the restoration plan with our partners over time. But essentially, what we'd like to do is remove the hard surfacing from the site, start to regrade and recontour, which is kind of what it's showing here with this slowly generating tidal channel. And then we'll be replanting the site. And then at the very, very end of all this work, that's when we'll really work to remove that steel piling wall and uh, make sure that it is um, connected to the Courtney River. Will there be opportunities for paddlers in the restored water flow? That's a great question. Uh, I would say that would be a question maybe for uh, the future owners of the site. Um, Project Watershed is mostly in this one for the restoration phase. So we don't really um, get to dictate um, recreational use of the site, but it would be cool. And I, you know, if you kind of just scoot in there, I mean, Maybe I'm speaking <laughs> out of context, but I think that it will be attached to the Courtney River. So there will be a certain water depth in there over time. So if you scoot in there with your kayak, I don't see too much of a problem. I'm just gonna pause the video. <laughs> Cheers from Betty. Perfect. So I will take you through the phases of the restoration planning. Currently, this is about a three year plan. So year 2021 where we are now which is what we'll be starting on monday is the concrete and asphalt removal on the site um, to do this we'll be crushing uh we'll be removing the concrete uh, with some excavators the help of cop can civil ltd who are our contractors crushing the concrete on site and then removing the concrete crush from the site and hopefully using that as subsurface for roadways and paving and all the other things that crush can be used for so we are looking to reuse and reduce waste as much as possible in this restoration process. Year two is going to be when the big earthworks will happen. So when I say earthworks, I basically mean they're regrading, the recontouring, soil removal, soil amendment, um, and then of course the planting of all the beautiful native vegetation on site. And then in year 2023, that's the big um, last planting push where we'll be doing a ton of stability monitoring and other monitoring on the site because that will eventually be the time where we remove that steel piling wall and reconnect flow from the Fort Courtney River into the site which is very exciting. I'm just going to take a moment to pause and um, yes and talk about these questions. How do plans for the site cope with projected sea level rise? Great question. So I will show you uh, our current construction plans um, and essentially they have sea level rise taken into account. About a meter of sea level rise taken into account. The back of the site will actually be built up a little higher than it is currently and planted with riparian upland vegetation and the idea is that will actually help protect um, infrastructure adjacent from flooding um, and it will help the site actually be really resilient to sea level rise. Can you elaborate on the infrastructure inhibiting connecting the site? Yeah, so that's the CVRD uh, sewage line and pump station. Krista, you're right there. Um, that one, um, we're in conversation with CVRD about what that could look like. Um, and we'll see, you know, it would be great to connect to Hollyhock Flats, but I think the restoration of this site is really paramount. So whether or not we get that punch through of connection, um, the restoration of the site will still be super valuable to salmon and other wildlife. Um, yes, the pump may move someday. That's a question from Eric. Um, the pump station and pipe may move someday. So that's kind of why we're not, um, why we're a little bit flexible on that front right now, because that infrastructure may change over time. So we kind of just have to hit that move it, moving target when it's perfect and see if we can eventually find a solution where we can get that, um, get that intertidal connection. I can elaborate on that a little bit. 
Sure, go uh, ahead, if you want, uh, Caitlin. Yeah, so we did look in our original plan at connecting across that sewer pipe into Hollyhock as originally the two sites were connected, as you saw in that historic air photo. Uh, but the issue was when we actually did a little more investigation into it, um, the depth of the pipe, it was closer to the surface than we thought. And what we would have to do to cross it safely is put down, you have to put down a cushioning bed of gravel over top of the pipe. Then we had to put an articulated concrete mat and then we would have had the crossing over top of that. So it was quite expensive, uh, you know, obviously to do that, to cross that pipe. Uh, it was, there was high risk as well because it's the main sewage connection uh, for the city of Courtney. Um, so you can imagine if anything went wrong with that, uh, that would not be a good thing. And then basically by the time we looked at the elevations and modeled them, you would only be getting connection through there through the two sites at a very high tide. So that was the issue. So for the amount of habitat gain that we were gonna have, it was gonna be expensive and risky to undertake that. And we did talk to the CVRD and ask about, you know, are you planning on upgrading that sewage infrastructure at any time in the future? Because then we could lower that pipe and it would be easier to cross. And obviously we'd have more connectivity that way through the different tidal cycles. Uh, and they said, basically there's like another uh, 20 to potentially 50 years life expectancy on the pipe itself. So probably not going to be doing that anytime in the near future. Playing that long game on that one. <laughs> mm. Perfect. I'm going to skip to the next slide. Thanks for jumping in, Jennifer. Always great to have her on hand for technical expertise. This is actually just a picture of our construction plan. So I thought I would share this with you folks so that we can dive a little bit deeper into the restoration planning. Um, I understand that maybe it is not super hard to see this tiny, tiny text. So I will actually tell you what those things say so that you can get a better idea. If I went in any further, you'd lose resolution. So that's why we're looking at it this way. But essentially what each of these lines designate is a different elevation. So like I said, this back swath here, this is really our upland vegetation swath. So this will all be upland. And like I said, it will be slightly burned. So it'll actually be slightly higher than the elevation of the road behind it. And that will actually act to attenuate flood and uh, give some resiliency to the site and to actually help support um, against sea level rise and things like that. Um, this you can see here, this is where we start to slope down towards the river. Um, these will be various levels of salt marsh. So we'll have high, middle and low salt marsh vegetation planted within the site. And within tidal marshes, uh, elevation is really important to plant survival. So each of these different kind of lines of elevation really delineate kind of a different plant community that will go with it. And I'll show you actually some of those later. And then you can see here, this is a cool part that people hopefully will like. This is actually going to be a deeper section here. This will be that tidal ch channel that uh, Betty's going to kayak through later. Um, and then this will be that um, salt marsh um, island here. So it's going to be a little bit of like a U with a deep pool here at the corner. So that deep pool will act as holding for um, salmonids, which will be great and uh, give them some kind of deep pool, um, deep pool habitat. So um, that's a bit of the overview of what the site will look like. Um, and this is some cool modeling that has done for us, cool and also very important. Um, so basically what we wanted to do is understand how our proposed restoration plan would function um, with not only with sea level rise, but um, with uh, freshet. So when the water comes down, when it's melting, what that flow would look like, as well as what tidal highs and lows would look like within the site. So I'm just gonna walk you through what each of these different diagrams is before I press play. But then um, once I press play, you'll be along for the ride. But essentially, um, this is the current site. So you can see all of this is super high and removed from the water. This is going to be our proposed plan. So this is the Courtney River here. This is uh, what it is currently. This is what our proposal will be. Uh, this is the discharge of the Courtney River. So this kind of looks like a storm flow to me. So you can see the discharge is low. It comes up to about 400 cubic meters per second, and then it discharges down. 
And then this is the water level at the Comox Harbor. So this is actually a gauge of tidal height as well. So you can see as it kind of goes up and down. And then this will all flow over time. So you'll actually see these uh, cool diagrams flow over time. I'm just going to go to the chat so I can answer any questions. In the past, silt has occurred some time. Will that be a future problem? Um, I might have to ask you to clarify that, Betty. Some the island at the mouth for the by were created by such moment. Well, during the industrial phase, there was dredging, and the river uh, bottom was uh, corrupted by by the flattening and the moving. But then also with construction upstream. Um, there was quite a bit of um, silt and, and uh, soil that came down and one of the biggest islands that you see right at the mouth of the estuary was created by that according to some of the locals that I've talked to who have been here for a long time. Um, we have a lot of um, development going on along the Courtney River, along the Puntledge River, threatened development along the Seoul area. Um, has there been any consideration, any, is there any way to anticipate that kind of issue? Um, I'm not sure it's a problem anymore, but don't want it to be again, and I never want to hear the word dredging. Maybe, I don't know, Jennifer, can I defer to you? I yeah, think. for sure, yeah. Well, the official policy now from the federal government is to no longer dredge the Courtney River. So yeah, so officially they're they're saying they're, that's the end of dredging. They're not gonna be dredging the Courtney River anymore. We are anticipating that we'll have some natural sediment build up in certain areas, and then we'll probably have some erosion in other areas. And, you know, it's hard to predict everything. We have to see how the site reacts to the conditions once it's restored. Uh, but some of the sediment recruit is good. We want to have some of that because what it's going to do is it's going to build up some of those salt marsh platforms. And so over time, you know, that area is going to build up and you're going to get more natural colonization by plants and more diversity. So I don't think it's going to be a huge issue at the site. And certainly it's nothing that our, our hydrological engineer has brought up. And they also have a fluvio geomorphologists that work with them as well. So we've had that sort of expert eye have a look at the project and it's not something that's come up as an issue. Like we're not expecting to get a huge sediment deposit on the site, for example. Thank you. You're welcome. And we are putting together a monitoring plan um, in partnership with Ecofish, which is really exciting. And I think accretion um, and erosion will be something that we measure on site, um, maybe using a metal plate method, but we'll see what the methodology will look for that in the future, but it definitely will be something we'll measure. So I am going to press play on our lovely modeling here. And I will try to follow along. So obviously the red is deeper. You can see as the tide goes up, things, whoop, there's a deep point. <laughs> Our pool, you can see the pool getting deeper. It'll be about maybe four meters at its highest, but you can also see how the water would inundate into that salt marsh with high tides and low tides. So most of the influence as far as the height of where the water inundates, a lot of that is tidal. Um, but obviously the flow from the Courtney River will be really important contributor as well. So that's just kind of a cool way to show about what the water heights will be like. I think, yeah, that the pool here is about a max 3.5. Um, and so, yeah, that was done by uh, Northwest Hydraulics Consultants. Um, and we've been working with them in tandem on a lot of the project. Does anybody have any questions about that? What would the river look like if it's Jeff? Sorry to just jump in, but um, at, at say a low, low tide, is it going to dry out the new channel bed or? The channel bed here, I can actually click to a low tide. Well, maybe I'll just pause at a low tide. Oh no, that didn't work how I thought. Okay, let's try this. Pause. Low tide, pause. So mm -hmm. this, uh, the deep pool will always carry water. Um, but at a low tide, there still will be a little bit of water within those uh, tidal channels, but it will definitely be a much more shallow than at a high tide. Thank you, Kayla. Perfect. So I'm going to jump into uh, a little bit better of a breakdown of what our restoration process will actually look like. So this is year one. So starting June 21st, which is Monday. Um, 
we will be starting the concrete and asphalt removal from 8.3 acres of the site. That's kind of the whole total site, but there will be a small swath of concrete um, for site access and along the roadside fence um, that will be left because we still need to access the site and remove the concrete. So it will be mostly all removed this year, which is great. We're gonna be crushing the concrete on site um, so that, that all that crush, um, the basically material that gets um, crushed up from the base concrete uh, will be reused for road subsurface. Um, the surface of Kuskusum is definitely a, a dynamic interplay, I will say, <laughs> of many different uh, compositions as it has been developed over time. So within the concrete, there's a lot of rebar, there's steel wire, there's like a steel wire grid um, complex that's in there. So we'll be removing the concrete and the rebar from one another, separating them out, um, and then crushing that concrete so that it can be repurposed. Uh, we have an in construction and environmental management plan that has been developed by current, current environmental. Uh, and so we will be planning to mitigate for any possible damages going along with the construction. Um, and I'm happy to talk, uh, Jennifer and I are happy to talk about the details of that if people have questions as well. So that will be the first year. Um, right now we're looking at work from June 21st to about end of August, maybe mid August, and hopefully all that work will be done by then. And then the work that will happen on site will be basically just be um, finding folks that wanna take that crush off our hands. If you know anyone, give us a shout. Um, and then repurposing that and trucking it off site. Year two is largely the earthworks and planting. I think I had a question. Nope, no questions in the chat. So this is largely going to be the year, which is next year, where we'll be regrading and recontouring the whole site. We'll be taking uh, any soil that isn't amenable to plant growth off the site. Some of it may have to be disposed at specific facilities because of um, because of the industrial history of the site, um, and we will have environmental monitors on hand uh, to kind of nav help us navigate that space and make sure that. Uh, all soil needs to be removed to the proper facilities and in the proper way. So that's something that we'll be doing. We'll also be bringing in some new soil um, just so we can have really good healthy soils to grow our plants in. And then we will be planting native vegetation and it will be uh, definitely an interplay of various vegetation. There'll be upland along the back. That will be kind of that riparian tidal forest. So it'll be a lot of Sitka spruce um, and other um, kind of large conifers. Uh, as you kind of move down the slope, we'll be moving into kind of what you'll see here, which um, is a part, this is a, a figure from our planting plan that was done by Caroline Himes. Uh, and this, you know, you can see a little bit, this graph says that there'll be sweet gale, hard hack, salmonberry, twinberry, nuka rose, red osier dogwood, and willow kind of at the upper edge. And then as you go down in elevation, you'll start moving into the high marsh middle, mid salt marsh and low marsh communities. So that top marsh will be tufted hair grass. You'll get some all sorts of stuff. Carex lingby maybe up that high. I don't know how I feel about this graph, but Carex kind of goes wherever it wants to. You got some Hen Henderson's checker mallow, some potentilla and some aster. And then here down at the bottom, that will really be that thriving Carex lingby community, as well as some juncus, some salicornia, and some other species as well. So it will kind of shift with every elevation and each of these different plants kind of has an elevation where it really succeeds. So we'll be looking to integrate that. And uh, one of the great things that the folks at Project Watershed did along with our partners is they surveyed Hollyhock Marsh and it's really acting as our natural template for this work. So uh, they basically surveyed the elevations in Hollyhock Marshes, Marsh and as well as the vegetation that was growing with those specific elevations. So this work is directly pulled from that work. Um, so Hollyhock is kind of acting as our template for the restoration, which is really great to have that kind of natural space there that we can refer to when we're doing this restoration. Uh, and for folks that love a good cross section, I don't know who those folks are, but I hope you're out there. This is the cross section. Uh, you can see, yeah, anyways not that interesting from my perspective, but there are folks that love construction diagrams. So this is for you. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And then year three, which is the big connection year that will hopefully be 2023. Obviously, this will be based on how far we get through restoration. There's going to be, have to be a lot of things in place um, that will have to happen before we get this far. But essentially, this will be the year where we make sure we have a fully vegetated site. We'll have mulching in places above high water to make sure that uh, that erosion control happens. Uh, Canada geese exclosure fencing will be installed all throughout the site to try to reduce the chances of vegetation getting eaten by those <laughs> lovely resident Canada geese. And uh, we'll have the Comox guardians come in and do, install some large woody debris for us in that off channel habitat. So in the um, <laughs> in the um, within that title channel, sorry, I'm having laughs at the chats. Um, within that title channel, we'll have some large woody debris installed, which will be really, really cool. It acts as a great salmonid habitat feature, and they love using those kind of structures. So we'll definitely integrate some of that into the planning. And then once we get the big stability sign off from our engineers and our partners, then we will start this lovely process of sheet pile removal, um, which will be very exciting. That will be a big thing. And then that sheet pile removal will be really, really the impetus for that reconnection with the Courtney River. So that's quite exciting. Um, two notes, selling off sheet piling as souvenirs. We're actually hoping to get quite a lot of cost recovery from the sheet piles. So um, if folks want to buy them as souvenirs, that would be great. But we're also hopefully going to get a lot of money from the recycling of the sheet pile, which would help um, just make the cost of restoration a little bit um, easier uh, to manage. With Sitka Spruce would not be a plant due to the height, due to the flight path of the air park. So there actually is already a Sitka Spruce growing adjacent to, um, to our site in the Hollyhock Marsh. Um, traditionally, uh, that site would have been a Sitka Spruce um, Grove and there is still some remnants of the Sitka Spruce Grove um, at Hollyhock. It's not an issue at Hollyhock, so uh, I don't anticipate it being an issue for our site as well. Well, the flight path does go actually right across the site, Caitlin. So, yeah. but we know exactly where that is. And so mm -hmm. we're just going to be strategic with our plantings, not to plant trees that are going to get absolutely huge and grow into that flight path. There you go. We've thought of it. So um, just some quick notes for the public, um, which of course is all of you folks and others. Um, some of the key things that we'll have to note is the work starts this Monday, June 21st. Uh, the concrete will be crushed on site and we will hopefully be reselling it and reusing it. The steel rebar and wiring from the surface will also be recycled to the greatest extent possible. Um, we are committed to reducing waste and the overall footprint of this restoration project wherever possible. Um, but the concrete crushing may be noisy. Um, so just know that the noise associated with construction, we are aware of that and that we will adhere to noise reduction bylaws and keep construction noise limited to the hours of 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. as, um, as uh, bylaws permit. Uh, we will also have to remove some of the vegetation that's currently growing on site. So there is some vegetation that has managed to succeed up through the concrete, which is pretty cool. Um, we will have to clear that in order to successfully carry out the concrete removal, but I just want to assure you folks that um, any trees removed will be replaced tenfold. So you'll have a lot more trees there than we ever cleared. Um, and then also, if you're interested in observing the work, that is awesome. We welcome your excitement and your interest in the project, but we just ask that you please watch from across the walkway or from the river walkway across the Courtney River rather than parking adjacent to the site or across the road. We just really don't want to do anything that will slow up traffic on Comox Road. It's a busy thoroughfare and so we just want to be really cognizant of that and also keep everyone safe. Um, so if you could please watch from across the riverway, we would welcome your excitement. Perfect, I think. Oh, this is just a cute, we did some uh, little uh, inlaying of where the lightning bolts are potential LWD plots. These just show trees and shrubs. This is kind of just a, a, a more visual observation of the, uh, of the construction plan here. Whoop. Perfect. Uh, I wanna thank everyone for coming today and for 
bearing with me while I went through that. So if you do have any questions, um, I would welcome you again to type them in the chat, or you can feel free to raise your hand and unmute yourself. I'm just going to stop sharing my screen so I can actually um, see all of your folks' faces again. And I just thought we should uh, thank some of our sponsors that are funding the restoration this year. I don't know if you wanted to give them a shout out, Caitlin. Yeah, sure. Love a good shout out. So uh, we've received, <laughs> oh, do you want to do it? No, it's fine. Go ahead. <laughs> we've received a lot of really significant grant contributions this year. Um, the biggest one of which so far is uh, a part of uh, BC's provincial COVID relief fund, their Healthy Watersheds Initiative. So we received a big contribution from them that really allowed us to get underway. Uh, there is a, one other significant grant that will really contribute to us that we're not quite allowed to announce yet, but it's a good one and we're thankful for it and we will announce it in due process and due time. Um, another one of our funders is of course, Fish and Wildlife Compensation Program. We have some more funding from the Habitat Trust Habitat HCTF, Habitat Conservation Trust Fund. Foundation. But yeah. Foundation <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> from them, which is great. I always use acronyms, so I find myself in a little bit of a uh, kick when I try to say them out loud. Then we also got a really nice grant from World Wildlife Fund that will support a lot of the monitoring work that will happen on site, which is really exciting. And there is also one more, Jennifer. Pacific Salmon Foundation. Pacific Salmon Foundation also gave us a great contribution. They actually kicked in a lot of funding that allowed us to remove the office demolition or did the, do the office demolition build uh, this last um, earlier this year. So that's great. Um, thanks Betty for your contribution. Does anybody else have any questions? I would welcome folks to unmute themselves and ask and let us know what they're thinking. Caitlin, I was wondering if uh, I kind of figured out how to type into this, but um, just uh, if you expect any archaeological findings and if if that's uh, covered in the unearthing of the of the property. Yeah, absolutely. I'm I'm so glad that you brought that up, Jeff. I realized I definitely uh, slid over that part of what we've been working on, but essentially what we've done is this year. We don't anticipate there to be too many archaeological finds um, because of the nature of the work. We are just kind of skimming the surface. But what we have done is we've engaged a baseline archaeology and they're going to be putting together an archaeological impact assessment for us. And then we also have uh, Comox, the Comox Guardians on site and they'll be doing a lot of the arc monitoring as we carry out this work. So if we pull back some concrete um, Comox Guardians will be there to just kind of take a peek at what's underneath and just make sure that there is no um, potential archaeological uh, sediments there. Uh, if anything is found, uh, we'll obviously halt work. Um, and then KFN is also working on engaging us with a process of what would happen um, and what that would look like if we do have any archaeological finds. But essentially, yeah, we'd stop work and um, go from there and work towards um, work with the guidance of Comox First Nation as to what they would like to see happen. Yeah, I've done some work with the, the guardians of the Comox First Nation. They're very competent. Yeah, they're really, really great. We're super lucky to have them as partners yeah. on this project. Cool. Thank you. Great presentation. Oh, no problem. Thank you for joining us. I appreciate your questions. Um, I am going to ask Jim B to unmute himself and uh, then you can ask your question, Jim. Thanks for using your hand. Hi. Um, yes, it's not uh, it's not on this particular site and I'm not even sure whether it's part of product, pro Project Watershed's work, but uh, a couple of months ago, just off the Dyke Road, there was a large section of um, culvert buried and then covered over with gravel. And I don't know whether it's like a fingerling habitat or if anyone knows, I, I, I haven't seen anything uh, uh, about what the purpose of that uh, construction was. Uh, I think that's in reference to the Tide Gates project, Jennifer, is that? Okay, yeah, so yeah, that was, 
that yeah that's a salt marsh build so it hasn't been vegetated yet so it doesn't look as wonderful as it will eventually but essentially that work is funded through the coastal restoration fund and it's part of the salt marsh restoration work that we're be, will we have done through that fund um, and essentially what we're looking to do is restore um, what was traditionally salt marsh habitat. So there's been a lot of loss of salt marsh habitat and tidal marsh habitat, not just within the Comox estuary, but all throughout um, British Columbia's coastline. So what we did is we mapped um, tradition, what was traditionally and historically salt marsh and just looked to find places where we could try to rebuild that salt marsh. So that's what we did on that specific project where we will be planting it actually on Sunday. So come Sunday, it will be looking planted and a little bit more um, contextual, I suppose. <laughs> um, and you'll be able to kind of see exactly what that purpose is. What, but essentially we're looking to just replace lost salt marsh habitat. Thank you. No problem. Yeah, and I'll just add that culvert was just uh, temporarily placed there for site access and then it was taken out afterwards. Jennifer, can you explain uh, the benefits of that? that island in um, this smolt or tidal pools for, for fish? Yeah, it's for foraging really. For, so what will happen is they'll of course move with the tides. And then when you have that salt marsh area that's vegetated, they'll find refuge there, uh, protection from predation, but they'll also, what they do is they feed off of the insect drops that drop off of the salt marsh plants. So it basically it's an area of refuge and an area for them to forage. Um, so yeah, it adds complexity to the area. Of course, there's other species that will utilize that salt marsh habitat as well. Perfect. Thank you, Thank you Jennifer. Um, and I will get to those great two questions in the chat, but I'm just going to ask Louise to unmute herself. She's got her hand up. So if you want to unmute yourself and ask your question, that would be great. Yes, thank you. I just wondered if there's any, um, any plan to integrate uh, some kind of walking path through the site at, at any point in the future? Yeah, great question, Louise. So at this point, um, with Project Project Watershed's role in this project is really to restore the landscape. So our role is really to restore the land back to what we hope was as close to uh, a traditional, what was there historically as possible. So that's really our big role. Um, features like uh, recreational trails and pathways, those will come under um, the jurisdiction of the city of Courtney and the Comox First Nation. So those have been thought of as being integrated into the plan and uh, that may still be a possibility, but one of the challenges with things like trails or boardwalks or biking paths is that they require ongoing maintenance in a really, um, in a really active way. So it would just be about figuring out whether that there is someone that really wants to own that ongoing maintenance for those infrastructures. Um, and if we can find, if we can find that jurisdiction or if we can find that uh, the place for those, then I think it can still be a part of it. But um, we just have to be really careful about those ongoing costs because they can be significant for whoever is managing the land in the future. Okay, well, thank you for that. And thank you for the presentation. No problem. Thank you for joining us. I really appreciate it. Perfect. Going to jump over to these great questions in the chat. Um, I think I might shift this one over to you, Jennifer, because it sounds like a tech question. Yeah, um, for a sure. question from Virginia about how is the sheet piling wall planning to be removed to reduce the slump risk? Yeah, it is a final step. You're right. And that's why we're doing it as a final step is to reduce some of the, the risk of erosion. I don't think we're going to see slump risk. We're going to slope the, the sediment accordingly so that you shouldn't get any, shouldn't have any sort of um, steep sided slopes that are going to be prone to failure and prone to slumping. We're trying definitely to avoid that. So we, what we'll be doing is we'll be looking at gradually inundating the site with water. So taking out, you know, sections of that wall at a time. The other thing that we may do is well as actually put in uh, temporary berms to control where the water enters into the site and then we can remove those berms and allow more water to come into the site slowly. The other big thing is to try and get some vegetation on the site right away as well and you know just getting the plants in there and their roots will stabilize things and that will help as well. So we're going to try to minimize that risk as much as possible uh, but yeah there'll be probably a little bit of sediment that enters into the river once we join the site back to the river. You can't avoid that uh, but we'll 
will be monitoring that carefully. We'll be making sure that it isn't, you know, with it's within the acceptable thresholds for fish and that we don't have, you know, pulses of sediment for extended periods of time. So it's something that we're going to very carefully monitor and watch and we'll have systems in place for sort of controlling how much water enters into the site and, and when it enters in. If we think we see something, you know, too much sediment or erosion or something happening that we don't like, then we can stop at a certain point. Perfect, great question, great answer. Thanks, Jennifer, thanks, Virginia. Um, just a comment from Leroy saying that he is looking forward to participating at a volunteer, as a volunteer, and I would say thank you for that, Leroy. We look forward to welcome you as a volunteer. Uh, there will be a lot of opportunities to volunteer on site, um, whether it's with the planting of the site, which I think will be a big piece that we would welcome volunteers for. And I think that there will also be some monitoring on site. We're hoping to engage sort of a citizen science squad to carry out some of those monitoring objectives. So uh, that would be a great opportunity and we'll definitely post those to our website, um, to Facebook. Uh, so keep an eye out for those and you can always call the office a little bit in a couple months if you're uh, not a website interfacing kind of person, we're happy to um, take calls at the office as well. Would you talk a bit about the interpretive center? Um, I think that this interpretive centers, I think this was historically an idea. Maybe Jennifer, I would defer to you on this one because I just don't understand the historical conversations that have happened. Around yeah, it. I think I think Betty's talking about the Estuary Interpretive Center, which is kind of one of the ideas that came out of, I believe, the Estuary Working Group is wouldn't it be nice to have an interpretive center on the estuary that talked about, you know, all the incredible diversity of life that's in the estuary, the historic, you know, sort of fish traps that were there, that kind of thing. But it's been something that's kind of been on the back burner for Project Watershed. We haven't been really actively moving that idea forward. Um, yeah, for, you know, we only have, much, have so much time and energy and capacity. So it's not one that we've been actively moving forward. And, you know, maybe it's something that um, Comox First Nation or the city want to take on and talking about infrastructure on the site. Maybe that's something they want to do there in the future. Uh, but certainly no plans to do it for Project Watershed anytime soon. Perfect. Thank you. Um, Eric, I saw your question earlier and I'm glad you repeated it. Thank you so much. How does the planting plan anticipate natural in migration of native species and also of invasive species as well? So that's a great question. As far as invasive species management goes, obviously we'll have to monitor the site really, really closely um, once we clear it and once we start uh, native species establishment, both through planting and through nat natural um, recruitment. Uh, that will be one of the aspects that we monitor closely for and manage very acutely. Um, invasive species are a lot easier to manage for if you kind of nip them in the bud. So I think that will be really our strategy there. We'll also be mulching along the upland areas like above where the high tide mark is and that will help um, inhibit a little bit of invasive species encroachment. We are also look, looking to plant in a way that hopefully we can shade out some of those um, really aggressive invaders like blackberry in the upland areas. And then as far as kind of um, invasive species management go, is going that we're doing currently, we're also currently um, trying to nip some of the invasives in the bud that are in um, in hollyhock marsh currently. So we're actually actively um, controlling canary grass at that site. Um, this summer, as well as some of the other invasives that are playing a little bit more of a minor role there. And that's with the hope that we can kind of lessen um, invasive species recruitment on the site once um, we've opened up a little bit of uh, bare soil. Perfect. Does anybody else have any questions? I don't see any raised hands. Um, if I missed, maybe I'll just scroll up in the chat here to make sure I didn't miss anyone's. Oh, one more hand from Jefferson. Feel free to unmute yourself, Jeff. There you go. Um, I'm just worried about this becoming a beautiful beach and with public access in the future. Is there any thoughts of that down the road at this point or, you know, just kind of as they're housing problem that we have right now and it's been inundated in Hollyhock in the past and whatnot. Um, has that been taken into consideration? 
Um, a lot of the site will be inundated with water at various cycles throughout the tidal cycle. So I think for the most part, and then a lot of like, if you look just east down Courtney River, you'll see the vegetation um, on Hollyhock Marsh right at the foreshore there. And that will be a lot of what will emulate. So that doesn't necessarily, um, doesn't necessarily own well to um, folks congregating there. Are you more so speaking to like um, encampments or people living? Well, on I don't, I don't, we don't know exactly what the end product's going to look like. It's not going to be a little Mexico necessarily, but it could be, could turn into a nice beach. Uh oh, um, in, in areas or so, so both really. Yeah, I don't, I don't think that's, I don't think that's something that we've really, um, we really anticipate too much with the site is having that much natu natural accretion on the foreshore of the site. Um, I think it's a little bit more likely that we'll actually, um, that we actually have to look towards erosion control methods, kind of similar to what you see as the fringing marshes that are on the site, uh, just a, across the river from the site. It'll be a lot of sure. Carex ling lingby right on the shoreline. So I don't think we're anticipating too much um, beachy habitat on the site. Um, but I think, like I said before, with things like trails and stuff like that, a lot of those social social value items will have to be managed by um, the city of Courtney and the Comox First Nation. And they'll have to make some decisions as to what they wanna allow as far as public access to the site. Fair enough, I'm envisioning it more as like very heavily vegetated. Yeah, and I think that will be very much the case. I think we had some good recommendations from uh, a fellow biologist named Nick Page, um, who did a lot of work on the, uh, the Brighton Park uh, salt marsh restoration project that's uh, in Vancouver and he recommended some good sight lines so that might be something that we maybe think of is like a way to make the site visible from the road or something like that so people can see past the vegetation um, but I think beyond that we're not looking at too too strongly at that angle at this time. Thank you. Perfect. Well, does anybody else have any other questions? This has been really fun to engage with you folks and to hear your perspectives. Thank you to you too, Betty. All right. Well, I guess maybe if no one else has any questions, we'll leave it there. Um, but definitely know that you can reach out to us at the Project Watershed office. You can reach us at projectwatershed at gmail.com. We are very happy to answer your questions and to engage with you folks about the project. Um, we're keen to have you here. We're keen to see this project come to fruition. So if you do have any questions, definitely give us a shout. We're here to talk with you and interface with you a big part of what we do at Project Watershed. So know that we're here to answer your questions. Thank you so much for coming tonight, folks. Uh, we, we welcome you and uh, we look forward to seeing what the site looks like in a year of time. And maybe we'll do another one of these next year so we can bring you up to speed again. Awesome. Thank Perfect. You. Thanks so much, folks. Bye for now.